The starter comes from Michel Marseille in Hammond, Louisiana. It features braised and shredded duck meat enclosed in a crepe and served with a cranberry blueberry sauce. Daniel Orr presents an entree from New York City, a formidable piece of prime rib, which he calls Cote de Boeuf, served with market vegetables and truffle butter. Michael Smith does dessert in Kansas City. It's a multi-step pastry that includes sweet tart dough, chocolate buttercream, and roasted pears, garnished with chocolate and caramel sauce. Misha Bell is an inn and restaurant in a scenic setting on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. The owner chef is Michelle Marseille, who over a long career has cooked for Presidents Ford, Reagan, and Bush. He was named Chef of the Year in New Orleans in 1981. His appetizer is duck confit crepe. All right, we're gonna do the duck confit crepe with little mesclun salad, which is over here. The duck is over here, I'll debone it, and I'm gonna put it cooking with some uh, stock that I have, duck stock that I have over here, you know. The duck braises slowly for at least an hour and a half. The crepe is started with eggs and flour. I'm gonna put a little bit of oil. A little pinch of salt and milk. This is not a sweet crepe, eh? it's a salty crepe. So I'm gonna add a little bit more milk. A non-stick pan was buttered. Let it color a little bit. Now some cooked duck is shredded. So this is the braised duck over here. I'm gonna add a little bit bone stock over here. Sugar is caramelized for the sauce and reduced veal stock is added to the duck meat. A little pepper. A little herbs. That one make me nervous. A shake. Blueberries and cranberries are added to the caramel. And there's the blueberry and the cranberry. Beautiful color. So inside. After the sauce is incorporated, the duck meat is arranged on the crepe. 
we're going to take the crepe and we're going to roll A drizzle of balsamic vinegar finishes the dish. Okay. The entree this time is from Gustavino's in New York City. Executive chef Daniel Orr has worked in several well-respected French restaurants, both in the city and in France. In addition, he has developed a line of spice blends and has written a cookbook. Here is his Cote de Boeuf. The chef begins by seasoning a huge piece of prime rib. So what I'll do is I'll first start by taking some room temperature butter. <coughs> some of the sea salt and the pepper mix, and then making kind of a paste out of that. And as you can see, I've scored the fat on the side of the Cote de Boeuf. You're gonna really rub this nice seasoned butter all over the Cote de Boeuf, the prime rib. Okay, and it's, it's best to have your meat out about a half an hour before you start roasting it, so it gets almost room temperature in the center, and that will allow it to cook evenly, so you don't start with a very cold center in the meat. So that's one of the important steps in this dish. One of the other important steps is to have a good cast iron skillet, which will retain the heat, because you have a large piece of meat here. When you put it on the skillet, if you have a thin skillet, it's going to suck all the heat out of the pan, and you're going to, it's going to stick, and it's, going to, um, it's, it's not going to caramelize properly. So that's, that's another important part of this dish. and we're going to start searing it. And what I do is I always sear it on top of the stove. Now if you're at home, you've got to smoke, this will really smoke up your kitchen. So what you want to do is just sear it on top of the stove and then we're going to throw it in the oven. Just want to get some color on there. And then finally you turn it on the fat side because one of the best things about a piece like, of meat like this is you have that nice coating of fat on the outside which gets really crispy when you cook it. And, uh, you know, you, if you cook it properly, most of the fat will cook out of the meat. And what you'll be left with is that nice, crisp, almost like a chip of, of fat on the outside, which is, is really a, a good, uh, the sign of a good piece of roasted meat. Drain out the excess fat. The meat will go into a 550 degree oven for 30 to 45 minutes. I'm going to throw in my mirepoix and roast 
roast the meat on top of that mirepoix, which will allow it to continue to cook, but it won't burn on the bottom of the pan. And then I'll put it in the oven. While you're waiting for that to cook, you can finish up your, your side dishes, which are the potato mousseline and the fricassee of vegetables. The mousseline, it's just your standard potato puree. Um, here at the restaurant, we use a tamis, which is like a, a screen that we take a, a spatula and we push all the potatoes through. It makes really, really fine uh, potato puree. And we finish it with some butter and some reduced cream. This is cream that's been reduced by half, so it's not on the, the Weight Watchers diet. And what you do is you just stir in that cream and you get what we call a mousseline, which means like a mousse, uh, very light and fluffy. You can see how the consistency of this is, really nice and moussey, and it's not like your standard mashed potato. And then for the fricassee of vegetables, what I'm going to do is take some truffle butter, which I have about a tablespoon. And this, when you put it in the pan, you can really smell that aroma, the, the truffles. It's really wonderful. I'm going to put in some wild mushrooms. Here I have shiitake, oyster, and a few uh, seps, which are uh, porcinis in Italian. Those lightly color. And then I have these, all these uh, seasonal vegetables. I have baby carrots, zucchini, patty pan squash, some wax beans, uh, asparagus, tomatoes. And we're just going to toss those with the mushrooms. Now in the restaurant what we do is we have a big cauldron of boiling water and we just drop the vegetables in very quickly and then put them in the saute pan. It's a quick way of heating them up and you always should make sure that um, when you're cooking your vegetables use very salted water to really bring out the flavor of the, the vegetables. I'm just going to toss those in and then we finish it with a little lemon zest and just a touch of coriander. About uh, 15 to 20 minutes into the cooking we're going to take some fresh herbs. I've got thyme and bay leaf and some garlic. And I'm just going to crush this slightly. You don't want to chop it up fine, otherwise it will burn in the pan. And I'm going to take the back of my knife and just tap the thyme and the bay leaf. And what this does is it releases the natural oils, which are what perfumes the, uh, the roast. And I'm just going to take that and toss it in with my roast and allow that to continue to cook about 15 minutes. Um, the other thing I've done is I've turned the roast over once during the cooking. Can you see I've got nice uh, caramelization on the roast. My herbs have caramelized. The vegetables have gotten caramelized, gives them a nice color. And that's what's going to really perfume my, my sauce. So another important part of, of doing a roast is to allow it to rest after you take it out of the oven. And you can see all that nice brown on the bottom of the pan. That's what's going to give your sauce all the flavor. So I take a little bit of red wine. The red wine's going to give you a, a nice acid to the sauce, which will cut the richness of the meat. Let that reduce down. When that almost gets dry, I'm going to add the veal. You can get this sometimes in, um, in supermarkets, they, they sell frozen glaze. It's always best to make your own. Basically what you do is you take a, a veal stock and you reduce it all the way down until it gets syrupy. And they sell it now in the frozen, uh, in gourmet shops, they sell it frozen. And a couple tablespoons. Now this roast, um, sliced thin, if you have a several course meal, could feed three to four people. We at the restaurant serve it for two. It's a Cote de Boeuf for two. But it would easily, if you have a multi-course meal, if you're going to have kind of like a three or four course meal at home, you could do that for four people and just serve two slices per person. And since the potatoes are so rich and the sauce is so rich, you really don't need a lot of meat. The sauce is finished with butter, a little more red wine, then strained. I put about half of the vegetables in the bottom. And what this does is it keeps the Cote de Boeuf from sliding around too much and then topping it oops, with the nice cote de boeuf, some of your fresh herbs that have crisped up in the saute pan. Finish putting the rest of your vegetables on there and then topping it with 
There's wonderful slices of truffle. Truffle was added to the sauce before presentation. A little extra sauce around for presentation. And just uh, dish out some of the potato mousse mousseline. Okay, and we send these out into the dining room for the waiters to present. The American restaurant in Kansas City boasts the tandem cooking team of Debbie Gold and husband Michael Smith. They came here in 1995 after working in Chicago. In 1998, both Michael and Debbie were cited as rising stars by Wine Spectator magazine. Here is Michael's pear and chocolate tart. This dish involves sweet pastry dough and a roasted pear filling, but the key to the dessert is a chocolate pastry cream, which we'll show for this demonstration. One of the elements is caramelized sugar flavored with pieces of cinnamon. Egg yolks are beaten. With two tablespoons of sugar. And a tablespoon and a half of cornstarch. And our caramel has happened. Now we have a great caramel color and then the flavor of cinnamon. And then be careful, very careful as you pour in the milk. Whoops, that's very, very hot. Finish pouring that in. And it doesn't really matter if you get all the caramel up off the bottom or if it kind of glumps up a little bit, it'll continue to warm up and melt through. Once the milk is um, obviously come back to a boil, we'll stir in some coconut and some chocolate, bittersweet chocolate. and let that melt real nice. Take another few minutes on the stove for all the chocolate to melt. We want to temper this into our egg mixture. We've got raw egg yolks here. We've got a very hot uh, set of cream here. So we will definitely want to uh, temper that, which is a process of slowly adding one hot thing to a cold thing to bring the temperatures of the two ingredients together pretty much in the same degree. Now that's warmed those eggs slightly. If I had poured all of it together, it may have cooked the eggs a little bit. So we'll add that back in there. Whisk that together. Now our pastry cream is almost ready. Now the cornstarch and the eggs will thicken this into a nice cream. It'll take a few minutes. It's, wet, it's already hot, but it'll take a few minutes for it to kind of come up to a boil. You should always whisk vigorously so that you don't uh, curdle any of the eggs that are in there, kind of maybe not, not quite mixed in. The pastry cream is strained, then combined with gelatin and beaten egg whites. Gelatin leaves were soaked in cold water. Our gelatin is softened very nicely. We squeeze out the extra, extra juice, the water. And we stir this into our very warm pastry cream. Then the egg whites are combined with the cream. So, once we kind of have it folded in, going to take a whisk and gently just continue to mix. We want to keep our air in there, but we want to mix it really well. 
To finish the dish, roasted pear wedges are arranged in a baked tart shell. They were cooked in simple syrup, pomegranate molasses, and butter. And for height purposes, we want to set this other ring mold right on top. That way our cream will cover the pears and come slightly over the top of the tart shell. You want to put just enough on top that you can spread it with a spatula. Refrigerate for an hour. like that. Okay, so a little sugar. A little sugar. Let's try this a little bit less. How's that? Sugar on top. Burn this like a creme brulee. Cookie crumbs were pressed into the tart and it's served with chocolate and caramel sauce. Thank you.